الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله ومصطفى نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهداه السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته and welcome to lessons in fiqh today's chapter deals with menstruation and we have introduced this chapter last program and talked about some of the issues related to it and inshallah today we will begin in reading the hadiths hadith number 118 narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha Fatima binti Abu Hubaysh had a prolonged for love of blood and Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught her the menstruation blood is a dark recognizable blood so if they come, then avoid fire, and and if it is the other like color blood, then perform wudu, meaning ablution, and over salat, for that is blood is, for that is the blood of offering. And in the hadith of Asma bin Ubais, radiallahu anha, reported by Abu Dawud, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, she should sit in a tub. And when she sees the yellowish color of the surface of the water, she should take a bath once for the Zuhur and Asar prayer, and take another bath for the Maghrib and Isha prayers, and take a bath once for the Fajr prayer. And in between this time, she should perform ablution before performing any act of worship which requires purification. This hadith deals with menstruation and it deals with it in the sense that lots of the problems caused by menstruation is when a woman has this bleeding and it's mixed with menstruation if a woman only has menstruation then she has no problem the minute she sees the blood she stops from praying she refrains from praying and the minute the blood st the, the stops, she goes back again. But the problem is with the times that she's not certain whether this is menstruation or it's just normal bleeding. Fatima bint Abi Hubaysh <clears throat> was one of the female companions of the Prophet ﷺ, among others. And they say that there were, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, ten female companions who used to have what we call istihaba, which is not menstruation, <clears throat> but rather a, a sort or form of bleeding that makes a person mixed up whether it is or it is not the, the, the monthly period. So Fatima came to the Prophet ﷺ and told him about her case. And the Prophet asked her sallallahu alaihi wasallam to recognize the bleeding because menstruation has certain characteristics to it the color is black and, and dark different than the reddish color of normal bleeding the smell is not that pleasing different to blood and it is usually discharged it comes out accompanied by stomach and back pains while normal bleeding is not so usually and generally speaking the monthly period is between six to seven days and um, some 
women are a bit longer than this, others are quite shorter than this. Scholars say that there is no limitation for the minimal period, meaning that it can come for just half an hour, and it can come for a day, it can come for six or seven days. There's no minimal period for it. But there is a maximum. They say that it could not exceed 15 days because it's a monthly period, and if it exceeds 15 days, then it's exceeding most of the time. And it cannot be uh, uh, the case normally. So they say the minimum, there is no minimum. The maximum, they say it's 15 days. And what happens when a woman has this istihada? What does she do if a woman has this bleeding and she's mixed up? She doesn't know if this is her menstruation or it is a, a, a normal bleeding. Scholars say that after looking at all the hadiths we have, there are three steps to be followed in sequence. One, if a woman is used to having her period in a designated number of days, whether in the beginning, in the middle, or in the end of every lunar month, She's, she has a fixed uh, uh, monthly period, then this is quite easy. For example, if a, a woman, since she uh, reached the age of uh, puberty, is used to having the first day of every lunar month until the sixth day, her monthly period. This is the period of her monthly period. And after she got married, after maybe uh, taking the birth control pills and with all these things that increase or decrease the hormones and the, the, the food we eat and the things that we consume, something happened and this monthly period or this menstruation was disturbed. And she started seeing the blood for about 20 days every month. This is not possible. It cannot be menstruation. So what would she do? Scholars say that she will sit, by meaning sit, she will not physically sit, she will uh, uh, refrain from praying and fasting her usual monthly period, which starts at the very beginning of every lunar month and ends on the 6th of uh, that month. And the minute the sixth day is over, she should shower and start to pray, though she is still bleeding. Because this bleeding from sixth day until the 20th of that month, we consider this period to be istihada. So this is number one, which is that she should refer back to her monthly period that she is used to. Because she knows that for the past six, seven, ten years, it's always been coming on the same time. <clears throat> now, if she doesn't have a fixed monthly period, meaning that when uh, she reached the age of puberty and she started to menstruate, three, four years she ha would have it at the beginning of the month, in the middle of the month, at the end of the month. It, it's, it's mixed. Sometimes she has it for uh, uh, two months. She doesn't have anything. And sometimes it comes ten days in a row. So now she is faced with 20 days a month bleeding. Of course, it cannot be her menstruation, as we said, that the maximum is 15. So, so what would she do? She doesn't know when to begin and when to end. As in the hadith of Fatima bint Abi Hubaysh, the Prophet wasallam told her that she should look at the signs. He told her that the menstruation blood is a dark, recognizable blood. So if it comes, then avoid prayer. And if it is the other light-colored blood, then perform uh, a wudu. So the Prophet is asking her to distinguish. And as I said, there are three signs usually accompanying menstruation blood, which is the color, the smell, and the pains accompanying it. And women have a feeling, they know. So if a woman does not know when her period starts, then she should recognize. 
and try to distinguish which is which. And the minute she distinguishes this is the beginning and this is the end, then afterwards she may perfor uh, per uh, perform wudu for every salah. And it, it doesn't matter what comes out because this bleeding is just a vein. But what happens, and this is the third step, what happens if the woman does not know when her period starts or ends and is unable to recognize she's bleeding 20 days every month and simply she cannot tell. The, old, the, the blood from day 1 to day 20 is the same, looks the same, whether it's thick and black throughout the whole period or it's light throughout the whole period. What does she do? Scholars say that she must refer to her relatives. She must look at those who are related to her in the sense that she looks at her sisters. She looks at her mother. And she sits or she refrains from praying at the same time they're doing. Because usually speaking, families, you know, girls and, and, and women in the same family share mostly the same period of, they, they have the same period maybe it's because of the genes maybe because of this or that regardless they usually have the same period that's the, whole, the, the, the family the females in the family share the same period in time so if this woman does not uh, uh, is not able to recognize which is which then she should look at her sisters if she doesn't have a sister her mothers if her mothers uh, mother is too old, she looks at her aunts, her cousins, and accordingly, because she cannot recognize or distinguish, she has to uh, uh, stick with them and presume that this is the period that she should refrain from fasting and consider herself to be uh, 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 menstruating, and afterwards she can easily perform ablution and uh, pray. Now, uh, in the hadith of uh, Asma bint Umais, the Prophet ﷺ is telling her to have obligatory bath for every two prayers. Dhuhr and Asr, one bath. Maghrib and Isha, one bath. Fajr, one bath. Scholars say, such as Abu Hanifa, Malik, and the Shafi'i, that it's not obligatory. And that this hadith, this order was either obligated or the hadith is not authentic. But uh, uh, to say uh, what some scholars also say, that such as Imam Ahmad, he says that this is preferable. It's recommendable. Why? Because she is not certain if this is pre a period or not. So she may perform a, uh, a total bath for every two prayers. And this is what we call al jam al suri joining on the surface. Because one delays Dhuhr just before Asr prayer, and she performs Ghusl, totally bath, total uh, bath, and she prefer, uh, performs Dhuhr prayer exactly just before the Adhan for Asr prayer is, is called, and then she prays Asr prayer as if they were joined together. Similarly is with Maghrib and Isha, and Fajr is by itself stands uh, uh, alone. But again, Asking a woman to perform a obligatory bath three times a day is asking too much. Though it's better for her veins, though it's better for her bleeding because water uh, uh, helps her uh, bleeding and decreases it, nevertheless, we cannot make it as obligatory. The scholars say it is preferable. Uh, I think we have a short break. We'll stop, inshallah. Stay tuned and we will be right back. You're live on Ask Your Questions, please. I would like uh, Sheikh to um, comment on that and to give me uh, how can I answer. Listening to the Adhan and repeating after the Mu'adhan is similarly a highly recommended act of worship. So how does he reply to her? This is what we call it an invalid analogy. Uh, because simply there is no comparison between answering four out of five in any exam and skipping a faridah such as or a pillar such as a prayer. 
No one is exempt from praying except women during the menses. Sister Um Saud also wants to know if a woman has to cover her feet when she's praying. The four fuqaha, Abu Hanifa, or Malik, or Shafi'i, or Ahmad, the, the greatest representatives of the fiqh schools, are in agreement. It is haram. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. The following hadith was narrated by Hamna bin Jahsh. Who will read this for us? Hadith 119. Narrated by Hamna bin Jahsh. My prolonged bleeding flowed abundantly and severally. So I came to the Prophet ﷺ to ask for his religious opinion. He said, this is the result of a stroke or stab by the devil. Therefore, you must observe your mens of, uh, for six or seven days. You should observe your menses? Uh, menses for six or seven days. Then take, a bath, then take a bath when you see that you are purified and quick clean. Pray and for quite, and quite clean. Oh, quite. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, and quite clean. Pray for uh, for 23 or 24 days and fast and pray, for that will indeed. I'm sorry. Sending my glasses. That's <laughs> okay. Indeed, suffice you. Suffice you, and do like uh, this every month, just as the order women menstruate. All right. I'm sorry. And are purified. But if you are strong enough to delay the, the Dhuhr prayer and advance the Asr prayer, then take a bath and combine the, the Dhuhr and the Asr prayer. Then delay the Maghrib prayer and advance the Aisha prayer. Then take a bath and combine the two prayers. Do so and take a bath at Fajr, uh, meaning dawn, and perform the dawn prayer. Allah's Messenger وسلم, said these two opinions. This one appear- these two options oh, I'm sorry okay these two options this one appeals more to the, uh, to my liking meaning taking a bath at these three times daily okay Zakallah khair. it's uh, difficult reading without glasses yeah, as it's difficult reading with glasses I have problems in in looking at this two small letters nevertheless uh, we got the information we needed and this is exactly what we mentioned before the break it's the same thing uh, just as <clears throat> a reminder Hamna bin Jahsh was one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. it is said that there are three sisters all daughters of Jahsh Hamna bin Jahsh Zainab bin Jahsh and another one and they all had this istihaba among one of the ten companions, female companions that had this. And Hamna bin Jahsh, um, she's a well-known companion. She was punished for saying something that was not true and lawful uh, uh, of Aisha. May Allah be pleased with her and pleased with her uh, too. And uh, she was punished for that. Uh, She is well-known. Her sister is the wife of the Prophet. Zainab uh, bint Jahsh. And again, I don't think we have to go through the hadith as it explains what we have mentioned just before the break. Uh, Nevertheless, we say that it is not uh, uh, obligatory for a woman to have a a, a total bath three times a day if she has this istihada, this running uh, uh, bleeding. But the Prophet says Asam, that this option is preferred to me. He, want, he likes this, the Prophet Asam, that though it's not obligatory. So if a woman has the power to uh, have obligatory bath, ghusl, three times a day, this is good because the Prophet preferred this, Asam, and it's good for her bleeding. It helps stop the bleeding, and inshallah it would be considered as a form of uh, cure and medication. The following hadith, narrated by Ummu Habibah 
bin Jahsh. So this is the third sister. There is Zainab bin Jahsh, Hamna bin Jahsh, Umm Habiba bin Jahsh. This hadith was narrated by Aisha, excuse me. Uh, uh, hadith 120. Okay. I think it's Rushdi. All right. Narrated Aisha radiallahu anha, Umm Habiba bin Tijas complained to Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the blood which flows beyond the menstruation period. He said, keep away from prayer the length of time that your menses prevented you. Then take a bath and over, and and over, and over prayers and cease to take a bath for every prayer. Okay. This hadith was reported by Muslim, so it's an authentic hadith. And it tells us that uh, uh, Um Habiba bin Jahsh did not perform three obligatory prayers, uh, three obligatory uh, baths for, uh, during the day. She performed how many? Five. Five. It shows you how strong she was because she didn't even want to have any slight uh, uh, doubt that her prayer was not acceptable and it tells us also that a menstruating woman must not pray and this is not mentioned in the Quran right does it say that a menstruating woman must not pray in the Quran no, no it doesn't and again this is very important nowadays we have uh, Satan doing so many things to divert us from our right path. And one of the oldest tricks in his book is to not accept hadith. So you, you find a lot of people, you know, showing that they are people of knowledge and they're pious. And when you tell them that the Prophet wasallam said so and so, he said, well, excuse me, I did not hear this from the Prophet, so I will not accept it. Only talk to me with the Quran. Now on the surface, this looks like a good argument. Because, yeah, okay, the Quran is the word of Allah. Hadith, we have weak hadith, strong hadith, uh, da'if, uh, sahih, uh, authentic, unauthentic. It's, it's a lot of hassle. And this is not the case at all. Because the Holy Quran is a general book. That is explained to us by the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam by his actions, by his deeds, and by his words. Otherwise, it would have been uh, sufficient and enough for Allah Azza wa to reveal the Qur'an and have everyone has a copy and that's it. There's no need for uh, a messenger or a prophet. And this is not the case. If you look in the Qur'an, you will find that there are hundreds, literally hundreds of issues that the Qur'an did not mention to us. And without the Sunnah, you're in trouble. So whether you take it all or leave it all, whether you take Islam, all of it, Quran and Sunnah, or don't try to uh, make up a new uh, religion. Because in the Quran, it doesn't tell you that you have to pray five prayers in the day and night. It doesn't tell you when to start and when to end. It doesn't tell you that Fajr is two rak'ah, Maghrib is three, and the rest are four rak'ahs. It doesn't tell you what, how to do them how to prostrate, how to bow. It doesn't tell you what to read and what to recite. It doesn't tell you about zakah, how, what's the percentage to pay on your gold and silver, and what's, uh, what's the percentage to pay on currency or on uh, the products that come from the ground, you know, your crops and, and fruits and, and vegetables. It doesn't tell you what you pay for your cattle, for sheep, or for cows, camels, how much. To, it doesn't tell you all of these things. There are so many things that it doesn't tell you, and it doesn't tell you that a menstruating woman must not pray. Only the, only the Sunnah tells you so. So you cannot separate them. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ warned us and said, Beware. I, don't want, I do not want to hear that a man sitting you know, on his couch, uh, leaning down on it and saying, Listen, listen. Whatever is in the Qur'an, we accept. Whatever is not in the Qur'an, we reject. This is unacceptable. The Prophet warned and said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I have been given two. 
the Quran and similar to it with it, which is the revelation of Sunnah. The Prophet does not talk anything except in accordance to the revelation of Sunnah. The Quran is different. Allah tells him to say something. But in the Sunnah, he makes his own judgment. He says what Allah tells him or he thinks is right. If it's wrong, immediately Allah will correct him as we've mentioned this uh, before. Brother Rush, do you have a question? Okay, so uh, we find few of people that reject Sunnah because they believe that our Quran is uh, revealed by, uh, our Quran is uh, protected by Allah. So there's no change inside it. But can we say to the people who rejected the Sunnah, kafir or not? Well, this, this is a very important thing. It is not our job to label people. It's, it's, now this is the, 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 the talk of the hour. Mm. If you begin looking around and labeling people, you'll end up in, uh, in isolation. So this guy rejects Sunnah, he's kafir. This guy does not put his right hand on his left hand while praying, he's kafir. But this sunnah, it's different with, with put your uh, right hand on your left hand. I mean that uh, in Holy Quran there's many first that Allah taught us وَمَا تَكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوا وَمَنَا حَلَكُمْ أَنْهُمْ فَانْتَهُوا أَتِيَ اللَّهُ أَتِيَ الرَّسُولُ وَأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ All what you're saying, verses. I completely understand what you're saying, but now to say that a person is a kafir or not, there are conditions that have to be fulfilled. Mm. And there are restrictions that have to be removed. Mm. And you cannot come to a person prostrating to Buddha. He's a Muslim. But he thinks that this is okay. You cannot go and tell him, you're a kafir. This is un-Islamically acceptable. Mm -hmm. You have to fulfill the conditions that he has knowledge, that he knows that this is not acceptable, that he is willing, and that he has the power to choose. And you have to remove the restrictions, which are that nobody is com uh, forcing him to do so. Uh, uh, he has no doubts or so on. So labeling people is completely out of the question. Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah say that whoever does this is a kafir. But we don't say individuals are kafir. Okay, so I get it. So it's a different story. Now if a person, I tell you, if a person refuses and rejects Sunnah completely, he's a kafir. Okay. Now I know that Dick or Tom rejects Sunnah. He claims to be a Muslim. He, it depends only on the Quran. I do not have the right to go and say, well, one plus one equals two. Whoever rejects Sunnah is a kafir, he rejects Sunnah, then he's a kafir. No, this is wrong. It, it's just a long process, and you have to go through that, and it's a scientific process, and it's not for you and I. It's for scholars to bring this man, show him what wrong he did, and to clarify things to him. If he still insists and he persists on, on doing this, the judge will uh, uh, give his verdict on him. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have for today's okay, program. I promise you, inshallah, next time we meet, we'll try to elaborate a bit on this issue. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.